See, see, give the guys an inch, look what happens. They take a mile off. <laughs> They don't catch the hint. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey guys, hey. I think I sneak up here. I was kind of getting quiet and oh, the thing started to come up again. So, oh, sorry, I gotta cut in. But anyway, good morning again. God bless you guys. What a joy it is to worship the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord. What a great worship set that was. And uh, we're gonna just get right into the Word of God this morning. Uh, just a few opportunities and announcements we want to let you guys know about. Women's prayer, guys, the ladies have scheduled an upcoming time of prayer set for Saturday morning, February the 13th from 7.30 to 8.45. You know, there's parking available here right in the lot on Saturday morning, and the elevators are open, so you can come right on up. Uh, all are encouraged to join in. All, all the ladies are encouraged to join in, and you can see Levon or Haley for more information after the service. Should be a joyous time. We want to just take the opportunity to invite the guys out too, because hey, the guys, we, we've been meeting here at 7.30. Uh, it's on, been ongoing, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful time of fellowship. We enjoy the coffees always, always on, and uh, uh, I think it's a highlight of the week. Uh, you know, I used to say that, and I still believe that. You can ask, uh, maybe talk to Frank or uh, uh, one of the guys, and, uh, you know, it's, again, uh, just a great time to get together to worship the Lord. Uh, Frank or Keone, uh, they can give you more information. The River of Life mission, guys, we've been praying for the river, and we've been part of the river, and I was thinking about it during the time of worship that... Uh, Cal uh, Calvary Chapel went in on the early days of the mission when Jack and Audrey Stankis were there at the mission and you know they pioneered the work and you know turned it over to Pastor Bob and uh, uh, now you know some ongoing changes are here but you know uh, again the, the ministry just has grown exponentially we started off with just uh, one or two rooms actually and uh, one of the guys from our uh, Salt Lake Bible study he bought some of these folding tables uh, the kind that you get at the uh, school cafeteria. He bought a few of those tables, and he said, you got to come down and check out the, the work, and that was it. We've been part of it. And, you know, a lot of the other Calvary chapels like Central Oahu and West Oahu have always uh, been participants, uh, as well as Honolulu and ourselves, and it's uh, just a good time. But, you know, uh, through many adversities and challenges, and when you're on the front line of the ministry, guys, the challenges will come, the adversities will come, the warfare will come. So, you know, you, we can anticipate that because, you know, the, the, the work of the, the ministry of the Spirit at the mission, through the mission, is uh, uh, seeking to save lives and seeking to save lives. And uh, again, uh, uh, you know, that continued vision for the ongoing work of what the Lord would have for the ministry and you know keep in prayer the staff and uh, uh, but above all all the visitors the guests and service recipients because you know through the years many have come through many have been touched many have been saved many have gone on to just uh, uh, get back into mainstream life so again uh, the work of the mission is ongoing keep those things in prayer and again uh, just a tremendous tremendous work Ladies, come out for the prayer meeting set for you guys. And uh, men, we'll we always see you guys on Saturday morning, so always a great time. But why don't we turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2 as we continue in our study through 1 Peter. I was kind of rocking and rolling with that last song, but <laughs> our God is awesome. But I was thinking, you know, I've never been really that light on my feet. I've always kind of planted my feet, and uh, I rock back and forth. And uh, I thought about this one guy. He was a longshoreman. I used to surf with him every afternoon out at Waikiki. And uh, he was a big guy, but very gracious. And he could just walk the, the mini tank uh, and, and hang on that nose and stuff like that. You know, he was really good, but light-footed, light, light, uh, light -footed, fleet footed And, you know, his son went on to be world uh, longboard surfing champion so it kind of ran in the family but uh you know just a great time i want to break out in a little dance with that great worship but praise the lord first peter chapter two why don't we pray father god we do want to thank you again for your goodness and your loving kindness and your faithfulness and 
We thank you for your tender mercies new for us this morning as we uh, just continue to study through our wor your word, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We praise you for the opportunity you give us to gather, Lord. We pray for those here in the chapel, Lord. And we pray for those that might be watching by the internet. And we thank you for those that uh, 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 just continue to uh, graciously uh, and generously support the ministry through the, the love and the provision of Jesus Christ, Father. We pray you continue to bless uh, the gifts that come in, Lord, and the tithes and the offerings, uh, all to your glory. We thank you, Father. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. First Peter chapter 2, I'm trying to get there. I'm all over the place. I was in the book of Acts and uh, uh, in Psalm psalm 37 but um first peter 2 we left off last week in psalm 118 where we tied uh, uh into first peter 2 where we're told in verse 4 uh in verse 4 of uh chapter 2 second peter uh, we're told that uh uh, uh um, to, we're told to come to him, Jesus, who was a living stone, choice and precious in the sight of God. And, you know, we, we, uh, we resisted. I think for many of us, we know that we resisted. For many of us, it wasn't that easy. For many of us, we had to come to that place of realization. Uh, and we're at the end of ourselves. And that's where it be became a beginning, a new beginning in the love of Jesus Christ. We also, in verse 5, saw that we, are, we ourselves are those living stones being built up into a spiritual house and if you can think that they threw out the, the Hawaiian Islands right now many churches many fellowships join together we're thinking throughout the world that we're all together being built up as a spiritual house in Christ Jesus for a spiritual priesthood on top of that imagine that that you and I priests ministering as unto the Lord and you know we we think that we can come and we say that we can come and we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord we come as those living sacrifices we come rejoicing as unto him and uh, uh, imagine that again ministering you and I ministering before the Lord offering those spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus we saw in verse 6 of chapter 2 that uh, the word choice uh, uh, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. Jesus' choice or picked out or, or as chosen, the word might mean. Here it's used of Christ, the chosen of God, the Messiah, a living stone, a chief cornerstone. If you've lost your way, guys, go back to the to the, the very beginning. Go back to that chief cornerstone. Go back to the benchmark of our life in building and construction and whatever it might be. We take measurements. We, uh, we take a, a, a measurement from here to there. We know that we started here. Here's our benchmark and we're going to go so long. We're going to build out to here. And uh, uh, Jesus himself being that chief cornerstone, we, we get all our marks, all our bearings from him. And from there we go. And if you've wandered away and if you made a jiggy jaggy cut or something and go, gone astray hey, come back to the benchmark come back to that chief cornerstone verse 7 tells us uh, uh, precious value speaks of precious value speaking of Jesus he's very costly he's very dear for us to believe but rejected by man he became a stumbling block and a rock of offense you know, I don't know how many times that you have maybe approached a friend, a neighbor, a family member, and you, you want to share about Jesus, and, you know, they're just not hearing it. They're just not receiving it. And, you know, they look at you, and they, 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 they might in their heart, they nod their head, and so on and so forth. But, again, much of the times within the heart, they're rejecting Jesus. And, uh, and, and for others, uh, he becomes a real stumbling block and a rock of offense. Hey, I don't want to hear it, man. I know about that. Yeah, I went to catechism. I did this. I did that. I went. I was an altar boy. Whatever it might be. You know, I, I used to stand down, sit down, fight, fight, fight. You know, and, and as the priest would tell us. But whatever it might be, a rock of offense, a stumbling block for many, the name of Jesus. And Paul would write to the Corinthians that the message of Christ crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews. The Jews just couldn't handle that. Jesus Christ come crucified. And foolishness to the Gentiles 
Gentiles. Remember, for the Jew, he who was hung on a tree was cursed. You know, Deuteronomy 21, the law of God, there are five books of the Torah, the five books of the law, said specifically that who was hung on a tree. And they said that, hey, Jesus came crucified, hung on a tree. Hey, he was cursed, man. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't our Savior. In that, we reject him. For the Greek mindset, you know, we're all, all in this Greek mindset. We like to know things. We like to find things. We like to research things, and we all think that uh, things should be so on and so forth. Hey, one and one is two, two and two is four, four and four is eight. Everything has a has a formula, and we must be able to figure it out. But for for the Greek mindset, in all their wisdom, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus was ludicrous. In their mind, they just couldn't wrap around that fact that Jesus was crucified. He rose from the dead. And uh, again, they couldn't understand. And uh, what they couldn't understand, they, they failed to believe. They say, hey, we're not believing this. We're not believing this. Uh, so, th you know, the, that's just where they're at. But, this cr uh, but his precious value is for us who believe, verse 7 tells. You know, f for we who believe, maybe we're not so smart like most of these Greek guys. or We're not of the Jewish mindset that says that hey, he, who, he who hung on a tree is cursed. But we just came in that little bit of faith given by God. He became this precious value for us who believe. We, we believed in faith. We received them. And now we, you and I, we receive all the blessing, all the benefits of that life, that new life in Christ Jesus, the, the, the life and the joy, the love, the peace, the realization that we are free from sin and the weight of sin, the burden of sin. And you know, that, that burden, the burdensome thing of sin is something that weighed us down. We carried it, we tried to put on a happy face and we're okay and, uh, and so on and so forth. But when the realization came that hey, we set free from sin, wow, it was like a great burden was lifted, a great weight was lifted and uh, you know in, in that vein we felt wow we had we truly have life and we truly have a spring in our step uh, because of that new life in Christ in verses 9 and 10 he says but you're a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for God's own position possession that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light for once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And uh, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are a chosen race. And you can kind of think that, wow, we are uh, chosen of God. And how is that, you ask? And how, how come me? And why am I so fortunate to know and receive life and liberty and love and forgiveness and hope? You know, some of you may have come to that place where you say, how come I'm so blessed, Lord? What about my friends what about my brother what about my sister how come uh, i'm chosen and you know some might even feel guilty at that fact that hey i got all the blessings of god and and you want it so desperately and you want it so uh, dearly for those loved ones around you and you, you 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 come to that place where hey you start questioning god and it's not a great thing to be it's a good thing to just say hey lord i know you got it under control i know that you love them as much as you love me but you know um uh you know that that fact that wha that nagging question how how uh, how is it you know how fortunate to know how fortunate to have all the gifts of god what about the other guys you know and uh uh, God is saying, hey, just go on with me. Just move out in me. And, you know, uh, the, the, uh, I, I love those guys more than you could think or imagine. All I can say is God knows who he has. We, we are a people, God's own possession, and a holy nation he calls us, a royal priesthood. He calls, calls us out of darkness. And uh, you might ask, you know, just stop on that. You know, how you say that, hey, how is it that I'm a royal priest? Or how do we belong to this royal priesthood? And how is that that, that uh, uh, we are adorned with all the adornments that the priest was adorned with, all the things of the breast, the ephod, with all the precious stones on that ephod, and all the things of the sashes and the turbans agor uh, adorned with all the glories of God? And I think that here in the... Uh, since the time of Jesus Christ, he adorns us. You know, we put on a gospel uh, of, of praise, a mantle of praise. Uh, we have this spirit 
not of heaviness, but a spirit of worship. And, and uh, we put Christ on. And Paul would, would write to the Colossians as well as the Ephesians. He says, put Christ on. And that putting on is like you're putting on a garment. You're putting on that royal robes, the robes of royalty that, that signify our sonship and our daughtership and our really our, uh, the priesthood of, of the Lord uh, upon us. Uh, in the Old Testament times, when the priests were ordained, you hear of that word, oh, when were you ordained? Oh, how's the ordi ordination service and so on and so forth? That word ordain is, simply means to fill the hand. You know, your hands were once empty. We came to the Lord. Lord, I have nothing. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I lift up my praise to you. Lord, uh, Lord, now as you ordain me, fill my hands. And that filling of the hands says that, hey, my hand is placed to the plow. My hand is uh, filled with the things of the workings of God. My hand is filled that I might minister as unto him uh, as that priest uh, in worship, in praise, in honor and glory, bringing honor and glory. And we still come saying that, Lord, I lift my hands on high. Lord, I worship you alone. Lord, I'm still empty and I still need your filling. I still need the filling of your spirit. I still need the filling of my hands for your work to be able to do and to accomplish your work. Uh, he called us out of darkness and uh, uh, we once lived the light in the dark. And I, I told you about that one fellow who, who came to the um, uh, the theater down here. Uh, uh, we had one of our Easter Good Friday services at the theater right down here on Bethel Street. And he came forward and uh, uh, he was dressed all in black, totally in black. Black jeans, black t-shirt, black jacket, black hat. And the guy was really black. You know, he was really darkened in his spirit. And he came forward and the light, the Lord just uh, released him from that darkness that night. The Lord filled him with the light of the love of Jesus Christ. And he showed up to the men's prayer meeting the next morning wearing a white t-shirt. <laughs> and I love this guy. You know, he was one of the old uh, OG guys, one of the original uh, guys from Lanakila. And uh, I said, oh man, Lord, you turned this guy from darkness into light overnight. You know, and uh, uh, I, I think the weight of the guilt and the thing, the, the sin that just weighed him down, and it was just a symbol of that blackness, that darkness within that heart. And he says that uh, uh, he caught us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And if you think that, hey, the wonderful light of the Lord, you know, uh, you think that, man, I can't see in the dark, but hey, in the light of the Lord, hey, he shines all things and uh, all, that, all that bad juju, all that bad stuff, uh, like the roaches that run when you turn on the light in the middle of the night, they run, they turn, and they run from the light of the Lord and uh, uh, receiving all of his mercy as a people. You see, mercy is his attitude toward those who are in distress. You know, you might have not thought about it and you think that, hey, I'm in distress and you think that you see somebody's flags, they got their flags upside down and that, that's a symbol of distress. And we think that, oh, we think of, uh, in my line of work, when you have a distressed vessel, that means hey, a vessel is out at sea and it's under distress. Maybe uh, what happens is in heavy seas, the cargo breaks loose in the hold and the cargo is rolling around in the hole of the ship and it's it, the ship becomes in danger of becoming damaged to a point where the uh, hull is uh, uh, breached and the water comes in and you know, you could have a distressed vessel turning into a sinking vessel, you know, but you know, when you think that uh, God's mercy is his attitude toward us, who are in distress. And you know, you might not think about it, but you know, really before Jesus, you know, before God, we were in distress. And even t at times now, we feel distressed out and we take out, take away the this and you got the stress. And sometimes we, we feel the stress, the stress of work and whatever it is, work, the stress of kids, whatever it is, the stress of, uh, uh, you know, other, other matters. You think of the COVID, you think of the guys going through difficult times. and. You get stressed out, but God's mercy is his attitude toward those who are in distress. Grace describes God's attitude to the lawbreaker and to the rebel. In other words, God's grace says, hey, 
I love you just as you are. I, I know that you are a dirty, rotten sinner, but I love you and I, I love you with my grace. And this is God's uh, grace describes God's attitude toward the lawbreaker and the rebel. Mercy is the act of God. God uh, reveals and pours out his mercy upon us. And peace is the resulting experience in the heart of man. You know, without that grace, without receiving the mercy, without, uh, 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 without these things, peace is not a reality. But we experience peace in the heart of man when we receive the grace and the mercy of God. And these are the things and the attitudes of God. And that's why you see throughout the New Testament, the greetings in the New Testament is continually grace and peace. Receive the grace of God. Receive the mercy of God and know the peace of God. The, the word is uh, related very closely to the Old Testament word we see, loving kindness. Loving kindness speaks of the hased, the mercy of God. And the mercy and the grace and the peace of God are all kind of intertwined within this beautiful word, loving kindness. Peter writes in, uh, in verse 10, uh, you are the people of God, now you have received mercy. And not, we can call ourselves, hey, we are the people of God, we are the cho children of God, we are this royal priesthood, we are this holy nation set apart for God's own glory and God's own works. Peter wrote to prepare the hearts of believers of hard times to come. No different today uh, uh, as we will experience uh, hard times, guys. We recall in uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the Lord's lo uh, loving kindness never ceases. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. And you know, often we quote it and often we forget, hey, where's that verse? But it's in Lamentations 3 and uh, we, we can think that his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. And a lot of times, you know, so much of the time we need his mercy. So much of the time uh, uh, we need to know his loving attitude towards those who are in distress. Because, you know, some situation, something's turned upside down in our life, something beyond our control. And just face it, we love, we love to have control. We love to have our hand on it. We love to be, you know, driving that car and, you know, turning it to the right or to the left. And it's hard to say, hey, God, you take over the wheel. You, you, you take over control. And uh, in that, uh, we wrestle with God and we wrestle with the wheel. And at times it becomes quite stressful. But in verse 11, Peter, Peter goes on. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshy lusts which wage war against the soul. And Peter uh, continues to refer to Christians as aliens and as strangers. He's saying, we don't belong here. He's reminding the, the believers there in Asia He's reminding them, he says, we don't belong here. We're just passing through. Don't get too comfortable. Don't seek for, you know, an easy life. And hey, uh, I'm not bothering nobody, no bother me. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that bother, bothersome things and bothersome times would be coming as the long arm of the Roman Empire was reaching towards that part of the world. But don't get comfortable. He says, remember Lot in Genesis 13. He saw the Valley of the Jordan. Lot, he saw the valley of the Jordan. And it was, uh, it, the, the word of God says that it was well watered everywhere. It was well watered everywhere. And, and now in a hot and dry and arid land, water meant wealth and prosperity. Uh, water brought an abundance of produce. It brought great uh, crops of fruit and grain. And that means hey, you would have plenty of bread and you would have grapes for wine. Hey, all the things that you needed are for sustenance. All the bread, all the wine. Water meant good uh, grazing for your livestock. It meant that you had steaks and you had lambs to roast and you had milk and butter and cheese and eggs and uh, Yet within the land of Sodom and Gomorrah that looked so well, lay every form of licentious behavior. Beloved, Peter says, I urge you to abstain from this kind of lifestyle. You see, Lot was just looking at the physical things. He said, this is a choice place. I'd like to settle here. 
And like for many of us today, we'd love to settle in some choice place. Hey, nobody bothers me. It's well watered. I got a lot of food. I got a lot of money. I got a lot of comfort. I got a lot of this and that. But it's all in the world. And, all, and as you uh, trade um, uh, li licentious behavior, lewd and lasciviousness, and all the things of the immoralities of the world, uh, beloved, I urge you to abstain. You know, we, we I, I think the statistics are uh, that we in the state of Hawaii have uh, been part of 400,000 abortions. I couldn't believe that. That's what I thought I heard. That over the course of, since Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, we, we've had about 40, 400,000 procedures. I can't fathom that. Man, that's uh, just amazing that we've, we've wiped out a couple generations of kids. And in the United States ourselves, you know, 50 or 60 million plus uh, children through abortion because, hey, I, I don't have time, I, it's not convenient, uh, you know, the, the child is not right, or maybe I'm not right, and let's, you know, let's just get rid of it. I, I'm not married, we're having a hard time, we're not even married, we have no money, whatever it might be. You know, out of convenience, we've just sacrificed all these kids. And uh, like, like Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, we become that land of uh, 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 lewd and lascivious lifestyles. We become that land of licentiousness. We become the land where the rainbow colors fly over Honolulu Hale or the state, the, the U.S. Capitol, whatever it might be. We, we proudly say, hey, we tolerant and we, you know, we allow all of this. And oh, in fact, uh, we're going to be teaching your kids and your grandkids this in public school. And you know, this is the, the program that we're going to purvey. This is the program we're going to push for tolerance and acceptance and a normal lifestyle uh, in this immoral world. But he says uh, in 12, he says, uh, uh, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, uh, uh, that they may be on account of your good deeds as they observe them. Glorify God in the day of visitation. Stand as salt and light, he's saying. Keep our behavior excellent, that our lives might glorify God. Know that as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we are these living testimonies known and read by all men. And I know that on my the Bible study on the waterfront, I would always say that, that hey, we are known and read by all men. And you are the closest thing, I used to tell the fellows and some of the gals that would come, that you know we are being read by men. We become the closest thing to a Bible, our very lives, our very actions, our very responses. And they... Um, People couldn't fathom it. People didn't like it. They, they, they liked uh, the old be the old guys. They liked the old guys because uh, it made them feel better about themselves. But all of a sudden, uh, uh, this, these guys that became salt and light became very convicting, became very salty, and became very uh, a thing that, hey, their light is shining in all my darkness, although they wouldn't say that. They couldn't put their finger on that. But that's what it was. Their lives became convicting. So he says, stand the salt and light. Keep our behavior excellent that you may glorify God. Here we come into a little bit of the hard part, guys. Submit yourselves to the Lord's, uh, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether to the king as the one in authority. Ooh. I saw that. <laughs> we prayed for the king, I mean the president yesterday, and I know, I, I know that some guys, some other guys might have been choking a little bit, you know. But we prayed, as, as, uh, as spoken of in Peter, I mean, in t uh, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, pray for the kings and for those who have charge and authority over your lives, that you may lead uh, peaceable and quiet lives, you know. Pray, and you know, it's it's a selfish kind of prayer because hey, you know the result is that hey, we want to live a peaceable, quiet life, undisturbed, and you know, uh, wh whether that's easier said than done, or that's the ultimate uh, goal of the Lord, uh, it could be something else very much so. And uh, he says, submit yourselves, and that word submit is. Uh, 
uh, is the word. It, it goes back a couple to a couple other Greek words, but the Greek word is hupotasso. It's to come under, and it speaks of leadership. It speaks of rule. It speaks of a military authority almost, that we come under the authority uh, of, of this human institution. We come over the king as the one in authority. Or the governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do right. And you know, sometimes uh, I believe that here uh, in our time that we live in, wrong is right now and right is wrong. And you know, this is the, this is the age we live in. And you know, some of the Old Testament writers talk about that. And uh, at, at times, you know, what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. And uh, it's flipped around, it's turned topsy-turvy. And uh, uh, you know, he's saying, uh, uh, submit yourselves, do what, what these guys are telling you, whether the king or the one in authority. And you know, I gotta turn back uh, to Acts chapter four, and I'll ask you guys to turn back to Acts chapter four. The real heat came up for the apostles and for the early church in Acts chapter 4, guys, as they were speaking to the people and the priests and the captain of the temple guard. And the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day before it was already evening. And many of those who heard the message believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And it came about on the next day that the rulers and the elders and the scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there and Caiaphas and John and Alexander all who were of high priestly descent. And when they placed him in the center, they began to inquire, but what power or in what name have you done this? And Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for the benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which became the corner, the, the, the chief cornerstone. Hey, we've been stuck on this verse for a while, yeah? Psalm 118, 22. And uh, Peter uh, speaks of this and... Uh, uh, here he, again, he's speaking of it here uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been, gi has been given among men by which we must be saved. And, you know, the Peter just very systematically lays it out for these leaders and for the guards. You know, he says, hey, we, if we're on trial today for the benefit of the sick man, how is it that, you know, we can be bad? How is it that we can be lawbreakers for healing a man? Uh, whom Jesus has touched and whom you have crucified and who he raised from the, he was raised from the dead on top of that. And uh, uh, the verse 13, I love this. Now they observed the confidence of Peter and John and they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, that they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You know, at times uh, we begin to make sense. At times we begin that, uh, to say that, hey, these guys, they are, uh, uh, they, they, they are rough, tough guys. They're not well educated. They're not trained in the things of the word of God, but they, they, they were marveling and began to recognize this one thing that they had been with Jesus. And you know, if it's one thing that we can do uh, as people would recognize that we have been with Jesus. And if the world could do that, and even as we are to submit to the authorities, uh, Peter goes on, he says, and seeing the man who had been healed standing by them, they had nothing to say and reply. You know, the evidence, the greatest evidence of a, of a healing in a person's life is his change, his change of attitude, his change of direction. You might say that's where the word repentance comes. He was going one way, but when he came to Jesus, he turned the other way around. And it's like that ministry, you turn for Christ. As you met Jesus Christ, you came and you did a U-turn. 
You were walking away from the Lord. Now you're walking with the Lord and toward the Lord. And again, seeing that man, they had nothing to reply. But they ordered them to go aside out of the council and began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? In fact, uh, for the fact that a noteworthy mir miracle has taken place uh, through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny this. But in order that it might not spread any further among the people, let us warn them not to speak more to any man in his name. And when they commanded them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You know, uh, what Pastor Chuck used to say is when the government tells me that I cannot preach or teach about Jesus, he says, send the cake with the file because I'll be in prison. They're going to put me in jail because I'm not going to stop preaching the word of God. And you know, uh, I don't know if that day is, uh, one, one day uh, there is uh, going to be a day that hey, it might be illegal to preach the Word of God. I don't know how close or how far we are away from that, but I have no reason to doubt that the enemy would love to snuff out the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. In other words, uh, uh, the, the guy says, hey, whether you saying that we cannot do this or whether God is saying that we can do this, we're not going to uh, um, uh, really, um, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. We cannot stop testifying of the, goodne the goodness of Jesus Christ, guys. And he says, you cannot stop us to do that. And when they threatened them further, they let them go out finding uh, no basis on uh, which they might punish them on account that the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old, whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Maybe some of you guys were about 40 years old when you came to the Lord, when you really gave your heart to the Lord, when you really shook off the chains that held, that held you back. And, and, and people are just amazed now because they said that this guy was that same old guy for the last 40 years, and look at him now. He got the touch of Jesus. There must be something about this Jesus. And uh, uh, this is really a miracle. This is really a sign that God is working, that God is moving, and maybe he is related in some way, shape, or form to this person by the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, they, they went on to that. And now, uh, look back with, at Peter with me, guys. Peter, uh, uh, Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake, uh, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether to king or the one in authority, or to governor as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. In other words, we didn't go storm the capital. We didn't uh, charge the, the rotunda at the state capitol right down the road. We didn't try and break in. We didn't try and do crazy stuff. But he says, act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves or bond servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. He, he says, honor the king, honor the emperor. But he says, above all, fear God. Honor your brothers, your sisters. Love the brotherhood, especially love those who are uh, of the household of God. And I know that within the church, guys, many have been disturbed um, by the results of the election, by the results of the overturning of the lawsuits and so on and so forth. And many within the heart, there are our hearts, we feel that hey, there was a re really a lot of cheating going on, a lot of things that were done. Uh, outside of the light of the law and what's right and so on and so forth. And, you know, we've, we've defaulted back time and time again to Isaiah uh, where uh, we look at that verse that says, hey, I saw the Lord in the year of King Uzziah's death. I saw the Lord high and seated on the throne, exalted, the train of his robe, filling the temple with glory. And what we can say is, guys, God, no matter what happens, no matter who won the election, God is still on the throne. God is still under control. 
God is still filled with his glory and the glory of his Holy Spirit comes and overflows upon us. Guys, look at Psalm 37. We're going to finish up here in Psalm 37. I had to repent because one of our previous presidents, I was so, um, in my flesh, I, it wasn't a good thing because there was a lot of disdain and a lot of disrespect for one of the previous uh, presidents. And I really had to uh, re repent because even as I said that hey, we got to pray for our president, we got to pray for our leaders, blah, blah, blah. And my heart really, you know, was hardened toward uh, uh, a lot of the things that he had done and what he stood for and so on. And, you know, I, I think that uh, it all comes back down to this Psalm 37, the Psalm of David. He says, do not fret because of evildoers. And, you know, I have in my Bible under do not fret, I have that underlined. Do not fret. For they uh, do not be envious toward wrongdoers, for they wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. He says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. And here I got trust in the underline. And, and what comes along with that trust is our good doings, our good works, our good uh, uh, things that we do out in the world and the good actions that we have as a consequence uh, of our love and the love of Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse three, he says, dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. You know, uh, when, uh, uh, when the, the, the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity by Babylon. J uh, Jeremiah wrote to the captives and he says, hey, build houses, plant crops, do good uh, to the people of the land. And what he was saying was, hey, it's a bad situation. You guys are going to be in, uh, in time out for 70 years away from your land, away from your country, away from your homes. But he says, do good, build homes, plant crops, give your, kid, give your sons and daughters into marriage, you know, continue to go on and do good for those around you. Make the best of it. And in the bad times, we trust in the Lord, we do good. We dwell in this land. We know that we're aliens. We know that we're pilgrims. We know that we're just passing through. But he says, do good, dwell in the land, and cultivate uh, faithfulness and cultivate um, Cultivate uh, really means, I have a little footnote in my Bible, it says to feed securely or to feed on his faithfulness. To feed on his faithfulness. You know, we gotta, how do we do that? We gotta feed on God's faithfulness. We gotta feed on the promises we have in his word. Otherwise, we surely lose it. We surely go crazy. We don't want, you know, a bunch of Christians going postal or anything like that, or a better yet, worse yet, backsliding. But he says in verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Does that mean you're going to get it like that? Does it mean you check your bank account and some, some guy deposited some large amount of money like Uncle Sam or whoever it was? And, oh, we made a mistake. Instead of 600, we gave you 600,000. <laughs> deposited into your account. But it says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. What, are, what, are, what does the heart desire? I think peace and rest and uh, trust and love and joy and goodness and gentleness. Those are the things that he, uh, we should be desiring. He says, commit your work ways to the Lord, verse 5. Trust in him and he will do it. There are things that are outside of our realm of making happen. We cannot go back. We cannot add ballots. We cannot do this. We cannot do that. We cannot do the recount. It's all said and done. But we got to just trust that God's result is, is that exactly. It's God's results. And we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, um, lose it over that. we got to go on. And we got to just do it and, uh, and say, hey, God, you're large, and then you're really in charge. And, you know, you've heard that. And I don't say that ca cavalierly or carte blanche, but it really says, God, you can do it. He says, uh, 
Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. I like this. You know that what that word says, uh, rest. To be or grow dumb. <laughs> so when somebody says, are you dumb? <laughs> and he said, okay, I'm resting in the Lord. But that word rest says to, to be... You know, it's, I'm so impressed with it, I, I got it written in my Bible. But to be or grow dumb, silent, still, relax. And when I say that word relax, I just want to collapse because I'm so relaxed in the Lord. I want to collapse in Him. But He says, wait, uh, uh, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And that word wait or uh, be patient might be wait in silence or stay still. But the word wait really, you know what it, what it has a meaning? It says to whirl, to dance, to give birth, to be in anguish, to become born, to give birth. New life is birth, something of beauty. Marvel at God's doing. You know, as we, as we wait on the Lord, and when He does it, we're going to marvel at His doing. And, you know, in that waiting, at times, it's like giving birth. We cannot handle. I don't know about how giving birth is, but I know it's difficult. I, I've seen uh, Lavan go through it a couple of times. It wasn't, you know, it was kind of challenging, you know, more or less. And, uh, uh, but that new life is birth, something of beauty, and uh, marvel at God's doing. When we wait on the Lord, when we trust in Him, guys, when we, when we rest, patiently and wait patiently for him he's gonna he's doing a work that we're gonna marvel at what god is gonna do so you know you that, that's where faith uh, comes into bearing guys we cannot see we cannot experience we cannot know what's going on but we wait we trust and you know and one day we'll marvel at what god does he says in verse uh Verse 7, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. And I, I got that underlined. I got rest underlined. I got wait underlined. Uh, I should underline verse 8 because it says cease from anger. <laughs> cease from anger and forsake wrath. And again, he says, do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. See, when we fret, you know, we get in the flesh. And you know, we can do bad things in the flesh, yeah? Yeah, I'm not you guys. I know you guys are angels, huh? <laughs> but do not fret. And he says, um, for yet in a little while, the wicked man will be no more, but you will look carefully for his place. He will not be there, but the humble will inherit the land. You know what, when we get that uh, saying, the meek shall inherit the earth, that's where it is. The, right here in verse 11 the humble will inherit the land I don't know if that it says that in the old King James or the new King James but the NASB says the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity you know the whole uh, the whole verse uh, chapter 37 is a great chapter you can read it from here but uh, you can underline those places that jumps out at you as I did in my uh, Bible but it's a great time the meek will inherit the land, and they will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. That's the, uh, the way it's all going to end, guys. You know, we, we're just kind of passing through. And like aliens, like pilgrims, we might be going through those hard, difficult times. But one day when we reach the end of our journey, uh, you know, as Jeremiah said to the children of Judah, he says, hey, make the best of it. Build your houses, you know, plant your crops, you know. Give your kids in marriage, you know, be good to the people of the land. Make the best of it. And, you know, uh, one day you, you'll be uh, delivered. You know, Daniel recognized that. He recognized in his heart that he says, hey, the end of 70 years are, is at hand. And he remembered the words of Jeremiah. And thus he began to pray, hey, Lord, hey, the words of Jeremiah, 70 years are almost up. What are you going to do? And, you know, that's when... Uh, uh, this king by the name of King Cyrus came on hand, and you can read about him in Isaiah 43 and 44. And uh, just a wonderful, he says that you will be my, my shepherd, you will lead my people. Here this pagan king would lead his people back to Jerusalem, back to the southern kingdom of Judah. 
God's word coming true and God's word is still being made true and God's word is still coming through guys and God is still seated on the throne and even though uh, we ought to be as good citizens as best citizens of the world as possible we know that we still gonna proclaim the name of Jesus and the great testimonies of what he's done uh, in our lives and in the lives of others uh, as we continue to be purveyors of the gospel message of Jesus Christ amen guys Father God, we do want to thank you for this uh, this time, Lord. And it's so appropriate, Lord, that as the administration changes, Lord, and new people come in and uh, the new brooms uh, come, to sweep, uh, come to sweep away good things, Lord, and bring in other things, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Father, uh, in faith and knowing that you are in control, Lord. We pray, Lord, in obedience, Lord. We pray for the emperor. We pray for the president and the governors. and those over us lord and we pray lord selfishly lord because we want to lead quiet and peaceable lives lord as uh, uh you uh, you wrote to young timothy lord and uh, we thank you father we praise you for the grace and the mercy that you've shown us lord and we thank you for the peace that is ours uh, as those who have come to the saving knowledge of jesus christ father we thank you lord we praise you for your faithfulness we thank you for your love in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.